everyone, and thank you so much for tuning in to my debut show on Stock Charts TV, Mish's Market Minute. My name is Michelle Schneider. People call me Mish, and uh, I will be with you every week thanks to Stock Charts. And I want to say thank you so much to the Stock Charts team who have invited me to join here every week and bring you what I look at in the markets and how I look at it. So, what I'd like to do is go through uh, basically how I look at the markets. Uh, uh, every day, but particularly uh, for this in terms of the overview of how I look at relationships. And I did a lot of thinking about relationships before I uh, put this together today and thought, you know, everything is really about relationships, isn't it? And right now, particularly at this time, we are definitely thinking about our relationships, our relationships to our family, our friends, to people that we hear about. Um, and so those relationships that we have really basically are also very key in the market relationships because let's face it, the market is behavioral. So in a relationship, you can measure it from a shorter term or a longer term. And plus, you can also have a counter trend relationship within a longer term relationship. So if we just bring it now to just our basic relationships as human beings, when we first start a relationship with somebody, very often that is when it is at its highest energy and has its highest level of chemistry. And sometimes that relationship will evolve to actual torrid, you know, where things get at a feverish pitch and you're very, very excited and your adrenaline is flowing. And then eventually the relationship becomes more familiar. And then after that, if you've been in a relationship like, say, the one I've been in with my husband for so long, it becomes either uh, one that's not only familiar, but either it's something that becomes the stuff of legends, or in some cases, happily not in ours, it dies. So relationships matter in human beings, in math, in science, in the economy, and in definitely in the markets. So what I like to do is I like to find relationships in the market that are either emerging, familiar, dead, and legendary, and then attach an actionable information plan to that. That's really my specialty. So let's start with the first level of relationship, something that has gone from energetic to torrid, and that's the relationship in the credit markets or the high yield debt versus the treasury bonds. So if we're looking here at four different charts, this here uh, is the chart of, we're going to start with LQD. This is the um, corporate grade bonds. And the corporate grade bonds have been extremely hot topic lately because of the fact that the Fed has really basically opened up the floodgates for buying corporate grade bonds. And you can see at this point right now, we're looking at a weekly chart. And on this particular weekly chart, what we're looking at is moving averages that include the 50 week moving averages. I like to use weekly charts because they give us a longer term perspective. The 200 week moving average, and this here is a 10 week moving average, so we're not really going to pay much attention to that. But you can see that when the market, and we're going to look at a ratio chart momentarily, but when this peaked out, it fell really hard within those three weeks when we saw that huge drop in the market. And what it really told us was that there was a massive liquidation into these high, uh, corporate bonds. And then, of course, when the Fed made the announcement about the repo buying and the stimulus, that's when we started to see it spike up. So where are we at right now is we've come right into the resistance here, close to the 50 week. So we're literally wedged between the 50 week and the 200 week moving average, which really makes the range in the nearest term, pretty simple. It either has to hold around 120 or get through over 126. And then I think we'll be able to get a better idea of where the market's going to go in the next few weeks after that. Now, we also have to look at the regular bonds. These are the treasury bonds, and this is the 30-year um, bonds. These are the TLTs, and you can see with the TLTs, with the interest rates having gone so low, negative in a lot of countries, but here in the United States down to zero, that this has well outperformed the corporate bonds. And so we want to look at that. Oops, I just realized I have two, two screens here of the TLTs. I apologize for that. The other one was supposed to be junk bonds. But in the junk bond universe, I'll just have to tell you, since I don't have a uh, chart right here, is that that is really um, 
that is, those are high yield bonds. And that is also a measure of how much junk willing uh, debt people are willing to take on. And that too had a massive amount of liquidation. So we're seeing a race into treasury bonds, a uh, possible stabilization of the markets through the corporate bonds. Junk is still having a tough, tough time that you can not see here. Here's another way to look at the junk. This is, uh, this is the high yield corporate bonds, HYG, which is another way to look at the LQD. And you can see right here, if I can find my cursor here, um, as you can see right here, and I can't find my cursor, here we go. The, um, this too has had a huge, huge move down. And this had a much bigger range of consolidation. And where we're seeing the buying coming into the LQD here, we're not seeing that same level of buying. And actually we're pretty far from the moving averages. And in fact, what we're seeing right here now is a situation where we're having an inside week. Again, that makes it pretty easy because you wanna clear the high from last week, and you certainly don't want to see this break the low of last week. It was a huge range week. Okay, so that's the first relationship. As I said, it's torrid because it's all really about right now the credit market is having a huge influence in terms of what happens next in these markets. Okay, this is a different way to look at it. This is actually a ratio. So this is the LQD versus the uh, corporate bonds. And so the first chart you see is the actual underlying of the LQD. And it's kind of what I just showed you on a weekly chart, although here we're looking at it at a daily chart. And you can see that there is this sort of V bottom that people are talking about right here. And then we have uh, the 10 day moving average, the same 50 and the same 200. And what we're starting to see here is actually what we call a death cross. So this is definitely entering into a bearish phase. What makes this chart so interesting is if we look under here, this is what we call a real motion indicator. This tracks momentum. And what you're seeing in the real motion chart here is that the LQDs are losing momentum, even though we saw a little bit of a pop in terms of the uh, underlying price action. So this is a negative sign until this actually flips back up. And then finally, what this is, is a ratio chart between the LQDs and the TLTs. And what you can see here is that when this was making new highs up here, this was actually already starting to fall apart. That was a huge sign that there was something tr troubling in paradise when the SPY and the Qs and the Dow were going to new highs. And meanwhile, the high yield corporate bonds were starting to really show deterioration. So again, simple, actionable information here is with the ratio here, still weak. This is a one month moving average. This is a six month moving average. If we can start to see this move up back over the one month moving average, again, that would be a positive sign. So now let's go on to what is more a familiar, and I'm also going to say a familial, longer term relationship. And that is something that I had created years ago called the economic modern family. And in future episodes, I'll show you that I've actually depicted characters for them, uh, not only in cartoon form and doll form, I've actually performed in them. And the reason why is because it is such an important aspect of the overall macro. What the economic modern family tells you is that that um, it gives you the business cycles, what's cyclical and non-cyclical. It gives you the inside of the economy. It tells you about supply and demand, how much spec interest there is, and when we have the very key sector rotation. So let's take a look and, tell, and I'll give you a little bit more information about them as we're looking at the chart. So we're gonna start actually down here. This is IWM, this is the small caps. I call that the granddaddy of the modern family simply because it's got 2000 small cap stocks all of which have manufacturing within the United States. So when you really wanna look at the supply side or the manufacturing side of the economy, you look here at our granddad IWM or Grandpa Russell as we like to call him. Again, we're looking at weekly charts here. So in the weekly chart, when again, SPY and Qs were making new highs, this could not even get, you know, can't see it on here, but it could not get close 
to the 2018 high and that 2018 high being right before we had the big crash and November and December of 2018, this couldn't even get there while we were making new all-time highs in the other indices. So there was already signs of stress three weeks into the year, long before the coronavirus was becoming an impact and long before we started to see that mass exodus into the high yield corporate bonds. Although, as I showed you in the ratio chart, something was amiss there too. So now if we go down to the present, we have the 50 week and the 200 week, which we've clearly broken down. And again, with the volatility that we have going on this particular week, we are still inside the range of last week. So we're going to look at a range of about 110 to show that there's going to be any signs of strength as we go into the weekend. And Fridays have been typically kind of bad uh, in the last several weeks. Or we're going to break down and hit closer to around 100 uh, and 90 being the low here. And again, that would not be a good side. And really, this is where you're going to see the economy reflected, the inside of the market, as Druckenmiller calls it, on the manufacturing. And he's got a wife. So the wife is granny retail. Now, this is brick and mortar retail, right? So this isn't e-commerce. This isn't Amazon, although what's a slight component of this particular ETF. But granny retail has been relaying problems for a very, very, very long time, long before we started to see the rally. If you're looking back here into 2019, you can see that this was suffering and barely even getting close to anywhere near its all-time high while the rest of the market was doing well. And the reason being is that the malls have emptied out, retail chains have really suffered, that has affected commercial real estate. But the most important thing to understand about the retail space, the brick and mortar retail space, is it makes up 70% of the gross domestic product. So when we're talking about the projections for the GDP coming up, one of the reasons why you're seeing such dismal numbers is not only because of the overall market, but because this sector has been killed and obviously consumer sentiment is extremely weak. So that's another big picture. Plus, by the way, just to show you how great these are in forecasting what's to come, this hit a death cross on the weekly chart in uh, 2019. Again, telling us that whatever rally we had was probably going to be weak. So that's grandpa and grandma. Now let's talk about their kids. So we're going to start here with IYT because if if grandpa is the supply side, IYT, which is transportation, is the demand side. And again, where other instruments were making new highs, this was trying to struggle up but getting nowhere near its 2018 highs. And so again, we started to see that there were some signs of weakness and it finally broke down under the 50, broke down under the 200. And now here we are, not in a death cross like we're seeing with retail, kind of what looks very similar to the um, IWM chart, but also with an inside week. So this inside week right here, again, is going to be ultimately telling uh, about which way we go. Do we, can we get back over, like, say, 145, or are we going to break down under 130 and then go back down to the lows here, which was really around 117? So far, what you're seeing in all three of these charts is certainly not a bullish sentiment by any means. Now we can go up to the top left here. This is biotechnology. So biotechnology is a very interesting sector because it's both a cyclical and a non-cyclical. So obviously, uh, it's affected from a cyclical, meaning that when the economy is doing well, this sector would do well. Because when the economy is doing well, these biotech companies are going to invest more money in research and development, and they're going to hire more people. When the economy isn't doing well, this becomes a non-cyclical because we're always going to need our pharmaceuticals. And right now, this has performed better for the obvious reason that so many of the drug companies right now are working on trying to get some kind of a vaccine. So that's why this is actually in better shape. It's above the 200, but below the 50, which again makes this very clear. This, by the way, I just want to tell you as a sector, peaked in 2000. 
15. So this thing has been going down and not necessarily getting anywhere near its peak for five years now. So now a lot of that had to do with opioid crisis and price gouging, et cetera. But nonetheless, that's behind us. So right now what we're looking at is can we clear 109.45? Or will this break down under 105 as we get into this week? And you can see that this is not having an inside week. Now, this has been the hottest sector of the entire family. And semiconductors, who I call sister semiconductors, and by the way, this is Big Brother Biotechnology, has been rocking for a long, long time. And when those new highs were happening, semiconductors was leading the charge. So here we are in a very interesting period of time because technology is extremely important as we are all home, either working from home or using our computers, et cetera. And that's why this hasn't fallen apart nearly to the level this is all of the other uh, sectors, but this is a strong cyclical sector. In other words, people are going to use certain levels of technology because they have to, but are they going to upgrade their iPhones? Are they going to buy new Fandango computers? And, and are they going to go out and buy other technology that isn't necessity to their lifestyle if the economy continues to tank? No. So that's a good gauge, not only of the cyclical sector of the economy, but we can see right here very clear technical as this too is having an inside week with the 50 week at 123, the 200 week much, much lower. And right now we want to see if this can even get anywhere close to that over that 120 level or what's going to happen when it starts to break down under around 110. So again, this is better for obvious reasons. This is better for obvious reasons, but still showing the signs of stress and now finally, let's talk about KRE. Regional banks made the family because regional banks are the rural banks, not the big banks like Bank of America, Wells Fargo, Citibank, et cetera. These are like your state street banks and your local banks that you have in regions, especially rural region, regions throughout the United States. And I can just tell you in New Mexico, the regional banks here are very much tied to oil and gas, and that's a thing all over the country. And so one of the reasons why KRE is doing so badly is because we also had on top of everything else, the price wars between Russia and Saudi Arabia in the oil market. So again, this was really showing signs of stress also, just like I showed you with um, IWM and IYT and XRT in particular, this went into a caution phase on the daily chart, which means it broke down under the 50 and the 200 long before anything else did. And you can see this also is in a death cross. So these two sectors are in death crosses. And now, just like everything else, having an inside week. If the rumors that the Saudis and the Russians are going to come to the table to cut production, then you will see this hopefully take out these highs right here of about 32. 33. If not, you might see a breakdown under 30, and then this low right down here is 27. So when I say that this is a familial relationship, these relationships not only really impact the overall market, but you can also really see when sector rotation happens, and that's usually a very good opportunity to make some money if you follow the rotation to where the money is going. So now let's talk about a budding relationship. We talked about an emerging hot torrid relationship with credit, a familiar relationship with the economic modern family and the macro. And what's a budding relationship right now is the US dollar as the treasury is allowing, the Fed is allowing foreign countries to sell their debt, their treasury debt in exchange for US dollars with food and a lot of indicators showing tremendous deflation what budding relationship could happen considering we're now getting endless amount of money being printed by all of the central banks could this indeed become inflationary so let's take a look at the charts that would impact that so here i have gold silver the dollar bitcoin and i'll tell you why i added that in a moment oil and dba which is the agricultural etf so with gold, let's take a look. Gold is actually now, had been in a range, is in a bullish phase, a strong bullish phase on the weekly chart, but also even on the daily chart, because you can see that this 50-week moving average is having momentum sloping up. And we tested it 
briefly two weeks ago it held and now also having an inside week so one of the reasons why gold is going up so much is obviously there's a hedge uh, when anything is in a crisis mode number one number two is physical gold is very very limited miners are closing down and because of the virus and B it could be an early warning sign that all this cheap money and low interest rates could actually spark some kind of a not just inflationary environment but essentially a stagflationary environment. So we can see that right now we can get through around 155, which if we look at the cash means if we can get somewhere about over 1620 in the futures, we get anywhere near 1700 in the futures, and this would put this at about 162, then uh, I think we can explode. And, uh, and, and at this point, I don't see any negatives in the gold, but of course, you know, that picture can change. Now, the other interesting thing is silver. Uh, next time I show you, I, I work with you, I will show you a silver gold ratio. The silver to the gold went down to an 85 year historical low. In other words, silver price to relation to gold was at a, an 85 year low. And that's coming back a little bit. Many, many people who trade the metals as I did down on the commodities exchange years ago will tell you that that's another key inflationary indicator is when silver starts to outperform the gold. We're a long way from there. But what we can see right now is that this silver has been holding up better than the market. And again, guess what? Inside week. So it's amazing how this week has been nothing more with all the chop than a digestion week in so many instruments. So if we can get through 14, that would probably be a sign that this thing has more to the upside. And of course, now if we break down, let's say under 11, then maybe we'll have to see another swoosh down. Now here's the dollar. The dollar, this is the continuous contract on the dollar. This is the DXY. And again, amazingly, inside week. So even though it's held these moving averages, and let's forget about the 10, let's look at the 50. You can see it's in a bullish mode. It did break down briefly. If we start to see any kind of unraveling in the dollar, Let's say it breaks down under 98. Here it says 97, 94, especially on a weekly basis. I think that stagflation or hyperinflationary environment becomes more realistic. And that's why so many people are long-term bullish in Bitcoin or alternative currency. Right now, this is still in a negative phase. It's not in a bearish phase. It's actually in a distribution phase because the 50 is still well above the 200. But nonetheless, you can see how it's been pushing against this 200 week. So again, if this can get through, say, eight in Bitcoin on a weekly basis, a lot of people feel that there will be a huge influx over time, longer term, into alternative currency, especially if regular currency somehow becomes unstable. And now let's move over to oil. So now this is, you know, obviously did really poorly. You know, we had the gap and we never recovered. Gap, gap down. We held uh, right here uh, until this week. We made a new low. And now today, again, rumors of potential uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia coming to the table, working with the United States. These rumors were not confirmed, but nonetheless, we're getting a little bit of a pop. Now, the reason why this is important into the inflation cycle is that obviously with really, really, really low oil prices, you know, we're not really looking at any kind of a hyperinflationary environment. However, oil may not necessarily be the most important part of that picture because in 1979, 1980, 1981, when we had really hyperinflation and haven't had any since, oil wasn't as big a factor back, back then. In fact, it came on the heels of the oil crisis in the mid 70s, which was the last time, by the way, we had any kind of stagflation. Now, finally, this is really the weak link right here. And there's a total disconnect between the prices of food when you go to the supermarket, especially as people are hoarding food, and the price of the raw materials. So this DBA encompasses wheat, soybeans, corn, cattle, etc. And right now, it's made two different lows 
at 1350 in the DBA chart. This to me is one of the most important pieces of the potential budding relationship that can go from budding to great chemistry to torrid, is if food prices start to pick up on the raw material. There's all kinds of signs that they can, but right now it hasn't happened because of the fact that people are, the, the metrics haven't hit because the metrics are still showing with people staying home and countries not being able to import food that it's low. However, there's also reports that countries are hoarding food. And of course, we're seeing the price, producer price index start to go up because of food prices in the supermarket. So I'm saying if this can close on a weekly basis over 14, especially if it holds that two bottoms here at 1350, another sign. So now let's look at a dead relationship, okay? This relationship used to be big, now it's kind of seen its day, and that's value stocks versus growth stocks. All right, so here we're gonna look pretty much right here at a um, ratio chart. This comes from our uh, Big View product that we have on the Market Gauge site. And what you can see here real quick is that um, value stocks, usually typically in a down market will start to outperform growth stocks. But value stocks have not kicked in as they ordinarily would during the market declines. So this is a good thing to watch because when the smart money comes back in, they will buy volume if they think the market has bottomed. So what we're really seeing here is the ratio. Let's go right down to this chart right here. This is the ratio between value and growth. And you can see that value, again, with this moving average, black moving average line, come on little cursor, where are you? Is showing right here that we have right now, the value is still grossly underperforming the um, growth stocks. And I'm just gonna move quickly because I don't wanna run out of town, time here. So now let's take a look at the last relationship that we have here. I'm gonna call this the legendary relationship. And that's the Buffett indicator and that's the gross domestic product as uh, compared to the uh, market cap. Um, and so essentially what Buffett does is he looks at this longer term indicator and he saw that the market was significantly overvalued back before the market crashed. And that's why Buffett himself has made no secret that he is actually holding about $128 billion in cash. And he just recently sold another billion dollars worth of bonds. So this is something that you wanna use in the most extreme situation. But let's take a look at the chart that I got here from the Buffett indicator. Essentially what it is showing right now is that back here in 2000, the, uh, the um, excuse me, the market cap was really, really uh, much higher than the gross domestic pro uh, product. So essentially what it was showing was that the ratio was overvalued. And then that went way down to its low here uh, back in 2008 after obviously we had the big crash from the mortgage bubble and has gone up ever since. And then here we went to re recent times and I don't know why I'm having trouble, here we go. This is right here in 2020 once again, Buffett's indicators showed that the uh, actual um, was the market cap was significantly overvalued to the gross domestic product. So that was yet another indication. Now, is this something you're going to use on a day-to-day -day basis? No. But what you're going to look at with this particular relationship is the extreme. So if we get to an extreme low after being at extreme high, then maybe again, that would be another sign. And it would be followed by everything that I just showed you. It would show that the modern family is starting to bottom out. The credit markets are starting to do better and that the commodities are also starting to do better as well as we go from deflation into more normal type of cycle with, uh, with raw materials and producer prices, as opposed to what we're at threat of doing right now, which of course is going into a stagflation environment. So that's a lot to digest, but I wanted to show you in my first round that this was really all the different things I look at and on a weekly basis, I will condense it down to simpler, but now you have a great introduction to how I look at everything's on a day-to-day -day basis and then bring it down more into a micro actionable format. So thank you so much and I look forward to seeing you all again next week and bye for now. 
Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.